Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm Pete Daly, CEO and publisher at the U.S. Naval Institute. I'd like to welcome all our guests, both in the audience and virtual, here in the Lockheed Martin Auditorium and the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center. This morning's panel is going to probe the role of AI in the battle space on military platforms and examine how AI changes the nature of naval warfare. Our moderator is Dr. Gavin. Gavin Taylor is Associate Professor at Computer Science at the U.S. Naval Academy. He's a, his area of academic specialty is AI and machine learning. He's also co-director of the Naval Academy Center for High Performance in Computing, Education, and Research. He chairs the development, also he chaired the development of the new data science major here at the Academy, which has just started off with its uh, group for sophomore year. Dr. Taylor will introduce our great panelists in a moment. And before I turn it over, there are some housekeeping items that follow. First, if you haven't already done so, please, please secure your phone and uh, make sure it's just on stun. And also, this conversation will last approximately 60 minutes. And after that, we'll open the forum to audience questions. For those who are here in person, we've got microphones down at the bottom of each of the big aisles here. I just ask that you actually ask a question quickly and please uh, tell us your name. And for those who are joining us online today, just please use the uh, chat feature and uh, we'll get your question up to the moderator. So now I'd ask our uh, guests to join us on stage. Thank you. And I will turn it over to Dr. Taylor to introduce our super panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, the growth of AI and machine learning is this generation's moonshot. In the last 10, 15 years, it has changed almost everything that we do, from how we drive, to how I turned off the lights in my room last night, to the national economy, and of course, to how we fight. It's a pleasure to moderate this discussion today on how the military is adapting to this unprecedented rate of change. This morning, we'll hear various perspectives from our excellent panel. Lieutenant General Mike Grun, his final active duty assignment was as director of the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, where he was instrumental in planning for the chief digital and AI officer within the department. He served multiple assignments as a Marine on the joint staff and within the intelligence community. He has master's degrees in applied physics and electrical engineering, and he told me he's very proud of his ability to be both a warfighting Marine and a tech geek at the same time. He's now retired, but he remains passionate about helping the Department of Defense be competitive with our threats. Next to him is Mr. Brett Vaughn. Mr. Vaughn has had a career of over 30 years, most of it in the Pentagon, which spans the intelligence community, the Joint Staff, and the Navy Staff. He is currently the Navy's Chief AI Officer. His responsibilities include AI strategy development, strategic communication, international engagement, and AI advocacy across the entire service. I asked Brett for a couple life achievements he's particularly proud of, and he made an interesting parallel. He listed two. He was lead for shaping AI investments inside Navy's Palm 20 and he went skydiving with his daughter on her 18th birthday. He said both were scary as hell, both nearly killed him, and once was quite enough. <clears throat> Finally is Dr. Sam Tangredi, the Lidos Chair of Future Warfare Studies and Professional of National, Naval, and Maritime Strategy at the U.S. Naval War College. Dr. Tangredi has published six books on national security issues, including AI at War, of which he is co-editor, and he has held command at sea. He was once portrayed as a short-lived character in an adventure novel, and is now looking for a graphic artist to help produce a comic book featuring an action hero, Alfred Thayer Mahan. <laughs> Welcome. So I want to start just with, obviously, this panel's purpose is to look forward. 
but I want to start with just laying a basic foundation. So to help us understand where we are today, I first want to ask our panel, what are the ways in which a warfighter would encounter AI in the military now? General Grun? Yeah, great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so, so in the department today, and uh, I know Brett, Brett is still, uh, still rowing, you know, at the oars there inside the department, um, but inside the department today, um, we, have, we have AI implementation underway, and, and I think it's really important to understand the context of uh, just like the commercial environment. Um, you know, AI is everywhere. Every industry, production, distribution, investments, uh, retail, I mean, you name it, social, I mean, you name it, AI is driving all of those industries. And it's purposeful. It's for competitive advantage. So inside the Department of Defense, we're a little bit behind perhaps the commercial industry, but we're, we're looking to achieve the same thing, and that is competitive advantage. How do we gain competitive advantage against China, against any of our other opponents, and uh, be, be able to operate with tempo and with precision? And so this is the real core of what we're, you know, what we're trying to build here. Today, that looks like things like uh, AI algorithms that recognize objects and imagery, um, AI algorithms that uh, detect and recognize patterns of activity, uh, AI algorithms that help the Defense Logistics Agency distribute fuel across a theater or help manage uh, fleet management and fleet maintenance. Uh, you know, even things like you know, uh, you know, building a watch bill that's sensitive to um, sailors' you know, uh, uh, skills and experiences, how much time they've already had on watch, how many hours they've had off, like, like uh, uh, personnel functions. I mean, you think like any function inside the Department of Defense where data and understanding the environment better can allow you to make better decisions or faster decisions or give you competitive advantage, that's where we're trying to implement AI today. Um, you know, at its, at, its, at its basic level, I mean, think about a car, right, that you drive today. You know, the, the car uh, continuously monitors the, the uh, you know, the fuel that's being injected. It continually monitors the air pressure and the, and the tires and the oil pressure, and it alerts the driver when, something's hap when, when something happens or needs attention. This is kind of, think about thematically, like how that applies in the military context, where commanders need to be able to drive, right? They're, they're, they're executing operations, but they need something in the background to help them alert to, hey, there's an opportunity here. Hey, there's a problem that you might want to take a look at. Hey, there's a, you know, there's a risk being created that, you prob that probably needs your command's attention. Or hey, you could optimize your, uh, your operations if you made these slight changes. That's really the state of the art today. Clearly, we're in the you know we're in the exploding you know in the in the in the knee of the curve here for AI implementation in defense. And when you think about uh, you know where this goes, um, uh, you know uh, individual drones, drone swarms. You know you look at what's happening in Ukraine today. Uh, you know where dismounted infantrymen can decimate large armored formations. That happens because of artificial intelligence, the ability to sense, the ability to make sense and act quickly. So, so all of the artifacts that you see in the combat environment today are indicators to us. And then when you, you know, that's indicators on one hand. On the other hand, when you look at what the transformation, the digital transformation has done for industry, it's very compelling that, look, we owe our young sailors, our young Marines, our soldiers, our airmen, our space people. I mean, like we owe them that same competitive advantage. And that's what we're trying to achieve today. Thank you. Mr. Vaughn, do you agree with all that? Do you have anything to add? No, I do agree. He, and Mike did a great job. But, you know, in my job, we, we paint two big buckets where sailors and Marines are likely to run into AI, and, and Mike talked about both of them. Either it's AI that fuels some level of autonomy in an unmanned system or a, a robot or drone, or it uh, could be a line or two of code that's a decision aid, a tactical decision aid. It could be a logistic you know, decision maker. Um, it could be uh, running on a computer in the Pentagon, on the bridge of a ship, on a SEAL's laptop, or anywhere in between. So I, th I think Mike did a good job at painting that picture. Um, but in my job, predominantly those two big areas, you know, autonomy and um, decision aids. Um, so yeah, good job. I wanted to follow up with you, though. He mentioned uh, we were behind commercial industry. 
in the engagement of AI. Is that something you agree with? Is that something, um, is that an accurate representation? You said we're, the, oh. the notion we're behind industry? That's right, we're behind commercial industry. So I would say that, um, yes. But in what aspect matters? Um, I say we're behind in the application and deployment of AI. Um, a lot of people say we're behind, but in the, in the R&D and the science and technology of AI, we have no peer, and I, I make that statement globally. Our researchers in the U.S. are the best, um, and we've been there for decades. A lot of the advancement you see in the commercial and industry sectors are built on the shoulders of basic research done in the government and in the Navy, um, and there are specific examples of that. Natural language processing is one of them. Um, where we're challenged now, where we're at risk, um, uh, with a pacing adversary, is taking all that great work and, and getting it to the field and the fleet and the force. That's the challenge, that's the key terrain today. So um, I'll just grab a line that the National Security Commission on AI threw out. They make no bones that we are today in an exploding age of AI deployment. The challenge for us is how do we pull those levers take all that good work and make it impactful for our sailors and Marines. So that's one of my big challenges, highest priority today. Okay, thank you. Dr. Tangridi, I suspect you have an interesting take on the strategy of where we are today with AI. Yeah, I, I am a strategist who looks and studies at technology, not a technologist who looks at technology. So I have a, a bit different perspective because I look at any investment in the Department of Defense Emerging Technology and ask the question right off, how does this deter or defeat the People's Liberation Army, uh, being that the main threat? So my view of AI incorporates the questions of, okay, how much is it gonna cost? How much does it improve our processes? What are the vulnerabilities that uh, it brings and um, what are the trade-offs, the opportunity costs. So, um, so, so some of the, that perspective is a lot different. So what I look at um, to go backwards in, in this question, what Brett was talking about on uh, advancements, the United States is ahead of its uh, competitors on the research and development side, but comma, China will be the head of AI soon because they're investing a lot more money and they need it for different purpose. They want it for social control, for control of uh, the populace uh, by the Chinese Communist Party. Great incentives to spend a lot of money in it. Uh, Chinese companies working on it are forced to give their data and information to the government for their purposes. We cannot force Google to work with the Department of Defense. We need to have other incentives. So although we are ahead in R&D now, we have the best scientists, best technologists and stuff, uh, our competitors have different incentives to approach AI and military applications of AI. China is looking for uh, the ability to control social control. If you, you've read anything about their social network, uh, they, uh, they are taking all the data from every individual. You know, have you ever defaulted on a loan? Do you support the party? Are you a party member? Were you ever at, have you ever uh, looked at a, any information, uh, dissident information? Who, who do you? And so they need to invest a lot in AI to do that. And then uh, I was going to read a section from the book about that, but... Um, if you read their, their five-year plan on AI, it talks about military first, and it talks about commercial civilian applications coming out of the military uh, function. Now, and the other thing they want is, so, is to have AI systems so that top party members can give almost practically orders down to the tactical level, but they can bypass uh, decision-making level that we value greatly. 
And on the other hand, Russia is looking for AI as, uh, for autonomy primarily, because they have to make up for the manpower. And as we're seeing, you know, they're looking at AI in land combat systems where you have autonomous combat vehicles. We're not quite there because we're concerned about keeping the human in the loop and the decision making, but I don't think our competitors are going to be so, uh, our competitors don't look at it in that direction. And so that may force us to more autonomy uh, on that. So yeah, hope that answered it. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so that, that was a really interesting comment about the, the competition we're in, right? And of course the, um, yeah, the possible competitors who are also investing in these and what might happen if we failed to invest in this appropriately. Uh, before we, we look at this really from the competitive side, though, I want to say specifically, I'd like us to address specifically from the American side, what will this look like if we do this well 15 years from now, right? So what does success look like? How will this change the nature of naval warfare for our military? And Brett, I think this is your job to answer this question. <laughs> and so I hope to start with you. Sure, so you know, if I project forward um, a couple things, I, I think if we're successful, we'll be able to um, effectively scale AI, which means an AI solution in one sector is easily ported uh, across the enterprise to other folks. So nobody has to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot underneath that statement, though. Um, I think on the face, I will see, I would like to see, I think we will see expanded options for the commander. In other words, to take Sam's comment forward, if we do our jobs and increase the sophistication of artificial intelligence as it drives uh, unmanned vehicles uh, in the air, on the sea, underwater. Um, when a commander is given a mission and he looks at the range of options in front of him, he will have a host of unmanned capabilities to pair with his manned force as well, which opens up a, a vast array, I think, of operational uh, options that he may not have had before. Uh, with less capable systems. And then, again, for me, war is a series of decisions. Uh, when do I go? What forces do I take? Where do I put them? How do I supply them? Um, where's the adversary? Uh, what do I do now? When do I pause? When do I stop? What does victory look like? What does defeat look like? All questions that could where the answers could be accelerated or more easily arrived at with the aid of a decision aid the, of the type that artificial intelligence is making today and is poised to make in the future. So what I would hope to see in that is uh, our commanders, our sailors and Marines in operational space making better, faster decisions than the guy on the other side of the table. And so your your office is in the Office of Naval Research, right? So what are some specific areas that you think are worth investing in to help us get to that point that you're thinking about? Um, well, I'll even go farther than that. Uh, so one of my, my job is, my office physically is in the Office of Naval Research. Part of my job jar is uh, the sci Navy Science and Technology Portfolio, which obviously includes AI. Um, in that, we're, we're doing a lot of work, obviously, in cyber, um, electronic warfare. Um, we talked about drones, uh, command and control. Um, but I think you, should, you could look across the entire naval task list. Uh, the, the, the potential is limitless, literally, uh, is infinite. Uh, maneuver, intelligence, fires, command and control, logistics, force protection. I can think of viable AI applications that could be applied against any one of those naval tasks or task areas. Um, but we have to be judicious and careful about where we place our AI bets because our resources are not infinite. They're most definitely finite. 
in that context, um, in the Navy, um, our emphasis today in the application of AI is defined by the CNO's navigation plan. So his strategic vision, right? Uh, today, within, if you break open the way the Navy staff is going after the navigation plan, and there is an AI objective in that set, um, the highest priority capability areas that we are focused on in delivering, develop, designing, developing, and delivering AI for are how we defend, how we maneuver, how we resupply, and how we shoot fires. Um, there's a lot more to it, but those are, for the CNO and for his strategic vision, that's the top of the priority stack for, for us in the AI community in leveraging both the work that's be, being done in the lab, that exists in the lab, is on the cusp of deployment, and we'd like to accelerate. Okay, thank you. General, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, Brett did a great job. I think, I think the key word that Brett used is scale, right? So, so I, think, I think that um, today um, we are successful in integrating the artifacts of digital transformation, technological artifacts. But what we haven't done yet is imagine a transformed military machine. And so a transformed military machine, so you asked about what does success look like? Success looks like overcoming tribalism today, for example. So like we're very segmented and tribal. That's just the way we were built as a, as a defense organization. We have to overcome that because in a digitally transformed environment where data is broadly available, algorithms are broadly available, where an Air Force sensor can cue an army you know, rocket battalion. Like that, that, doesn't, that won't come if we don't imagine that future. So looking beyond technical artifacts, that's not a bad thing, but look beyond that to imagining what that integrated digital enterprise will look like. What are the processes that we need to put in place? How do we integrate those processes? How do we achieve scale so that you know, this is the magic of software companies and AI companies today, is they can achieve scale. That's why they make so much money. We need to make so much competitive advantage by achieving scale across our enterprises. And that takes um, a cultural shift just as much as it requires a technological shift. And I think that's a really important thing that maybe we miss, um, you, you know, as, as Dr. Tangredi mentioned, you know, with the Chinese. They're, they are exquisitely organized against this problem. Civil military fusion with a stated objective to be AI dominant globally by 2030. We need a similar banner that, that will organize us and so that we, we are enormously innovative as a system, but we need that organization now that really gets the drum beat for competing with a highly organized opponent. The question is, does an innovative actor beat an organized actor? And, the, and I think the answer is, if that innovative actor can be just organized enough that you can actually bring your innovation to bear in, 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 you know, in great ways, in tempo and, and in precision, then you will actually start to achieve success. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned this you know, problem that's well known to all of us who work in the, for the DOD about the siloing and the tribalism that takes place within the DOD. Do you think that, um, you mentioned the ability of different tools to work together, right? An Air Force system helping to target uh, an Army system. Do you think that this will actually help us solve this problem that's been around for decades? Or, I know I'm asking a very difficult question, yeah, yeah. but how and does this help? It, it, absolutely, it is critical to our success uh -huh. as, a, as a department, as a warfighting force, and uh, you know, as a you know, as as a as a, 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 a pillar of innovation and comp uh, competition, we have to do this. And so, so the uh, uh, you know, you think about like like achieving scale. Think about jointness, for example. So today, jointness, and I was on the joint staff. Jointness is a great concept. Jointness is almost like a deconfliction environment, right? Okay, I'm going to put the Marines here. The Navy's got this piece. The Army's going to be over here. And there is certainly mutual support that goes across those lines. But, but largely, it's a deconfliction process. Think about what an integrated process looks like from a joint perspective, where, again, that Air Force sensor can now cue, uh, you know, fires elements from the Navy, from the Army, from the Marine Corps, you know, on a small island, you know, outside the South China Sea. 
Like, like you won't get that competitive advantage, the ability to like integrate your operations like, uh, uh, you know, naturally, right, natively, until you actually get to this integrated digital environment and, and then all the things that come with that. AI is one of those things, but the conversation is really about do we become a digitally transformed military? Do we fight effectively in an integrative way? And can we imagine what that looks like so that we can start putting some lines, some chalk lines down so we're gonna, we can start putting some walls up? Okay, yeah, thank you. Dr. Tangridi, I suspect you have some strategy thoughts about where AI is going to take us. Well, uh, first I wanna compliment Brett and his, the way he's done oversight on maybe programs because to me, their approach is very much on the practical side that how do we solve this problems we already have? It's not about transformation. I, I disagree a lot with the general because transformation could be bad as well as good. So we need to, we need to look at the vulnerabilities. I mean, during the 2000s, early 2000s, you had Secretary of Defense, Secretary of the Navy, uh, CNO telling us that the transformational system of the 21st century was littoral combat ship. You know, uh, where did that get us? So uh, I'm straying a little bit from AI, but the reality is that um, when you look at scaling up AI or working with AI across the force, I personally don't see a big transformation needed. What I see is us to like Brett is doing, deal with practical issues to improve the way that we are carrying on these particular tasks, whether it's integrated fires or to uh, communications or whatever. The, the promise of AI is being able to speed up, taking the big data, be able through the algorithms and uh, be able to speed up some help to decision makers. It's all about you know, John Boyd's OODA loop being able to go through that cycle faster and aid the decision makers. But there's, again, vulnerabilities. Uh, AI systems are best at uh, rule-based, complete information tasks. Uh, there was great heralding of uh, AI system beating the chess master or the go master. The problem is, in those situations, the rules are known. You have complete information in the sense you know what you're, you know the last move of your opponent. War's not like that. You don't quite know where the needs uh, information is going. Uh, what the information is, your opponent's trying to deceive you. So we have to work on AI that can handle deception. And that's something, if, if you're, anybody who cares working on AI, focus on that question because uh, commercial AI can't handle that. It's not part of the business model. But military applications need to figure out how to literally get machines not to trust them, to, to trust themselves to doubt their own uh, output. Now, it, it can be done. I'm just saying that the commercial sector has not focused on that. You have uh, DARPA, uh, if you're familiar, Defense uh, Advanced Research Project Agency, has a counterpart in the intelligence community, IARPA, and they're now looking at the question of deception of big data and how the AI systems will manage that. The other thing that uh, working on is AI will be useful for uh, decision makers to help in decisions, but they're also going to help with us being able to uh, control or develop autonomous systems. And uh, there's a lot of issues involved with that. A lot of people get concerned about you know, the development of killer robots, th that sort of thing. But if you look at a potential future war against a near peer competitor, uh, we are not going to have the complete information that we think. The way I, I envision it is we will have a lack of information. So we need to focus on systems that can deal with the practical tasks even when they don't have complete information. That, that is a challenge. That's something the commercial world does not. I, I've talked to a uh, CEO in the commercial world say, how do you handle deception? And he says, well, it's all a question of having more data. You know, if you have more data, you can find the pattern if somebody's trying to deceive you. But you know, the question is, where's that more data gonna come from in a, in a, a, a war against a technological near peer? And, and that, that is the question. So I don't see transformation as 
what we should focus on. It's going to happen, perhaps, as we develop the systems. But what we need to do is develop the systems for the practical applications now. That, that, that is the way. That, that's my view. And uh, we were talking uh, earlier, we kind of talked, what sort of advice do you give to um, younger officers who are looking forward to the future? And my advice is, of course, learn how to use the AI systems with man machine teaming. You definitely do that, need to do that. But you also need to learn how to uh, fight without having information and without a dependence on those systems because the first target of the potential enemy is our satellites, our communications, our networks. So again, when I look at AI, I said, you know, is it survivable? Can it handle deception? Can it operate with limited information because it's designed to crunch all that big data? So uh, I compliment what Brent is doing, uh, but I don't view transformation as a necessity. Yeah, thank you. So we, we've already addressed the elephant in the room now about how China has been very open about we, China, from China's perspective, they say we intend to dominate this space. Right? We intend to put a huge investment in this. We tend to dominate this, both in the commercial and in the military realms. And so with the, so it's useful to think about vulnerability then in that context. So we've all now mentioned some very ambitious goals of what we're going to do with AI. Require massive investment into AI. And of course, investment means there's an opportunity cost. There are other things that would also help us fight better that we're not funding if we are investing this heavily into AI. So why is it that, say we lost the AI race, why does this make us more vulnerable than failing to invest in other technologies? Mr. Vaughn, again, I think this is kind of your job, right? It's your job to fight for AI funding, so I'm gonna start with you. Well, again, I, you know, in my job, we almost never start with AI. As Sam mentioned, we start with a problem or a challenge or a mission or a function where AI can, can deliver a return that's worth the investment. Mm -hmm. And that return is usually in some kind of mission impact or output. That's how we measure success. So for me, and we have various vehicles and tools to measure how we're doing, fleet experiments, demonstrations, events like that are, are some of those where we can watch the needle move. And AI is not the right hammer in every case. Uh, that's part of my job too, is helping step through a calculus of problem A, AI type B, hypothesis, results, it's worth it or it's not worth it, right? Um, that's that's kind of what the calculus looks like. Um, I, I want to go back to something Mike said, though. For me, um, you know, AI for the Navy, for the flag mess, for my um, my uh, uh, my compatriots in SecNav, we view AI as a competency. That means it's part technology and part human skill sets critical skill sets that are at the core of AI, whether you're a user or developer. Um, I do see a need for, you call it transformation, I'll call it a shift. Um, and the heaviest lift of that shift is not technology. Technology and the technology investments are pretty straightforward from my perspective. Um, I go back to the silos, um, I know people don't like the culture word. I'll throw it out there, organization or practice. The way we've been doing business um, compared to the way you effectively design, develop, and deploy AI today are different. And I'll just give you one, ex one aspect that, that kind of makes the point, I hope. Um, and maybe this is a good opportunity to introduce you all to the four horsemen of AI. Speed, scale, coherence and resilience. Number one is speed. Um, AI runs on a, a yardstick of seconds and minutes. 
Um, if you're betting the farm on an AI capability using a yardstick that is measured in months and years, you're shooting behind the duck. You probably won't even see the duck until it's too late. Um, there is a window of work and investment that uh, will shape you know, whether or not we are successful, whether the juice was worth the squeeze, right? That's what I'm looking for. But it's going to take not just chips and software and hardware. The way AI is effectively developed and delivered today is very different. It's a very iterative cycle. It's not linear. It's not a fire and forget technology. You always have to revisit it to make sure it's not being spoiled or poisoned or disintegrated or, or, um, or unhinged. Um, you're always looking at it. Constant is the watchword. Development is constant. Maintenance is constant. Test and evaluation is constant. Um, verification is constant. Um, we're used to designing, building hardware things. Ships, planes, submarines. They go through T&E, they go out, they operate, they degrade, we bring them back, we fix them, send them back out. AI is, is different. And it's going to take, uh, I think, on everybody's part, from the deck plate sailor as a user, um, all the way up to the flags that have to decide where to invest. Um, we, have to, we have to recalibrate. Doesn't mean we need to change the entire Navy, we just need to change our lens to some degree, and really to, to the extent where we can fuel the transformation uh, or the shift that I think Mike uh, talked about, because right underneath AI is a digital, it's a digital substrate. And if you don't get that substrate right, you're gonna be running in place. Um, I will just tell you, today, another part of my job is to watch the inventory of of Navy AI related effort. And we literally have, I'm watching over a thousand AI related efforts in the service today. Um, we will not see a return on investment that's satisfactory to, get, to go against our high priority problems until we hit that substrate and get it right. That substrate is data, it's compute, where the compute needs to be, and it's competency. It's, it's training our developers, our acquisition core, our contractors, our requirements writers, requirements holders, everybody to kind of turn the dial and think, get in a digital software mindset for us to be successful. Thank you. Sam, I think you had a thought that you wanted well, to jump in. Um, I'm going to follow on a little bit of that as far as the choice of uh, where you apply AI. And uh, I've been thinking about example also some people say well, you don't seem to support AI as much as others. You know, what do we not use it for? And I'll, I'll give you an example that I look at, and I hope nobody's got this program up, but surface ship, uh, vibration analysis of surface ship rotating machinery. We can determine based on uh, the vibration of rotating machinery whether it needs to be maintained or something. Someone would say, well, perfect thing for AI to do it. Yes, but we've been doing this for 40 years. We have the software, we, have the, we know how to do it. Let's apply the AI to something else because the AI may not improve what we're doing. And when people talk about the AI program improving something, you know, my question is, how much will it improve? Will it improve this decision making 10% or 50% or 100%? I mean, I think he's looking for those big percentages. There's a lot of things that you would think because it's involved data and big data that yes, we could apply to AI for that, but you're going to be spending money on something you may not, in fact, improve. And, and that's, that's one of the factors when you think about where are we going to apply this. Um, you, uh, um, did you, you mentioned something about, in the beginning, about uh, potential opponents in this question, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the, the problem in dealing with the potential opponents is this. We have the best Gavin Taylors. We have those people. They are doing good research at the university level, uh, cutting edge. Our opponents don't necessarily have that, but they are looking to pour resources into this AI. Um, 
I forget the name of someone who was recently working for a, a key uh, AI scientist who was re recently working for Baidu, you know, the, the Chinese company, came back to Stanford working at, at, uh, for startups. And the realization is that AI being used there is going into social control, which is something we don't want. But they're going to pour an investment that we aren't going to pour into because the incentives are different as far as what to achieve. We're looking at solving particular problems, man-machine teaming, and then autonomy. Uh, you need AI for the, uh, if you're going to have autonomous systems, you certainly do. And uh, that's what we're looking at. We're not looking at this grand use of AI to monitor society. So again, investments are different. So we're ahead, as I said, with R&D. Because we're looking at the practical problems and we're looking at uh, where does AI help us, where doesn't it? Now, I think that AI will be very needed in autonomous systems. You know, most uncrewed systems we have are actually controlled by, say, a pilot, you know, just not located in the cockpit but somewhere else. We're shifting more and more to the autonomous systems because in any conflict against a near peer competitor, uh, communications and others are going to be spoofed uh, or, or are going to be taken down. You know, um, midshipmen need to continue to study celestial now because GPS, won't, GPS is going to be jammed. Uh, so the autonomous systems will probably work in a way that like submarines did in World War II. You send it out on a mission. It can adjust its mission as appropriate to the conditions but you probably don't know whether it's going to succeed that, in that mission until it actually comes back or not comes back. And so that's where you need the, the AI to be able to drive those. And we're being driven to that. That's, you know, eventually we're going to have to move to that, even though we want to keep the humans in the loop because we won't be having the information like we had in, for the last 25 years in prosecuting wars and, and our, Iraq or Afghanistan, where the opponents can't uh, can't uh, um, can't uh, affect our comms or affect our information gathering or affect an, our networks, and that's what we're going to see. And that's why I think the Navy's looking at uh, autonomy as a big feature for AI. Mike, we've covered a lot of ground since you've had a chance to weigh in. <laughs> yeah, we have. Uh, uh, I, I would just say this. I mean, I, I guess I, I don't, um, if, the, if the criticism is that, well, we're not sure that all the problems we solved all the time by AI and that, that's mature today, um, that's probably true, right? But, but uh, digital transformation, not AI transformation, digital transformation is a complete shift of your environment to create me uh, a, a culture of measurement where you're actually paying attention to the things that you, you do so that you can have objective outcomes and you, you can predict out uh, projective outcomes and you can plan on that data environment. And AI is one of the tools. AI is not perfect today, but I will tell you, um, you know, between 2020 and 2021, um, AI, private investment in AI doubled, right? Doubled, right? So, so, so think about how long we've been doing AI. Think about all the corporations that are actually, you know, using this and using it, again, uh, you know, spoofing difficult environments use it, that's used in cybersecurity, it's used in detecting fraud by credit card companies, it's used for, for analyzing massive markets, you know, it, you know for security tra trading. I mean, like, and, I, and I'm not suggesting that the department is, is ready to turn it over to a computer, but you have to, you have to see that digital transformation is happening everywhere around us, and it has key competitive advantages. And we can be smart about the way we implement it and the scale that we implement it. Digital transformation doesn't have to come from the best algorithm and work its way down. It comes from a culture of data collection. It comes from a culture of observe, orient, decide, and act, where observing you know, if NGA can use an algorithm to detect objects and imagery and name them, then that's a digital advantage that we can take advantage of. Maybe in an algorithm, but maybe it just you get your your uh, your imagery readout faster, right? So, so like all of these these incremental gains 
in digitization, in measuring data, and helping to use that data to make good decisions, that's what leads to a digital transformation, right? It's not a thing out there that we're bringing, we're going to dump that on the department. This is how does the department gain competitive advantage in the same way that our opponents do, in the same way that our commercial industry examples do, and yes, is it a dirty, dangerous, uncertain environment? Absolutely. That's what war is all about. And we have to be comfortable with that, right? Being comfortable with that, with, with, the, with all the exigencies of war, is something that military officers, military non-commissioned officers, this is why we swear that oath, right? This is why we have a professional obligation to ensure that our capabilities evolve so that we can gain competitive advantage or at least keep pace with our adversaries. If we're not thinking that way, if we're, if we're going to say, well, it's too hard and throw our hands up, then we're not uh, meeting our obligations as, a, as, as service members and as uh, institutions. Can I follow on that? Yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so, you know, when I look at um, um, strategic documents, whether it's NDA or National Defense Strategy or what the CNOs asked us to do, I, I, I find it hard in my mind to see how we're going to hit those capability targets without a technology like AI. And you're not going to use AI effectively against those objectives without that digital substrate that Mike just talked about. It's absolutely necessary. If you're not doing that, like I said, you're going to be running in place. The beauty of it is if you do that digital substrate, get that right, you float all the boats, not just AI. Nanotech, biotech, added manufacturing, all the digital animals, all the, the things you typically find in the emerging technology, disruptive technology toolbox will benefit, and you'll be more effective at using them. I think one of the key measures for us and a priority for me, a lot of the times it's hard to tell how effective a capability or a type of AI is being unless you get out there and you use it and see the results. Get our reps and sets in. The, the, the actors on the global stage that are deploying AI um, in mass are learning lessons good and bad, but it's all fueling. Um, we have a lot of ammo in the lab, a lot of work in the lab that we can and will be pushing out and watching, but we have to get in the hands of our sailors and our Marines, take a risk um, above the water line and watch and observe, and that's how we'll measure, and that's how we'll go back to the original question of this was worth it, this was not. And the payoff on this to this degree, that was a good decision. Yeah, um, I just two fingers. Um, I want to mention something that, that uh, Brett has just mentioned, and that's to find out whether these systems really work, we have to test it at sea. I had the pleasure for a brief period of time working with Admiral Wayne Meyer uh, after he retired and stuff, the father of Aegis system, and uh, perhaps the second greatest program manager in the Navy besides Admiral Rickover. And he would constantly say, you build a little, you test a lot. You build a little, you test a lot. And that's how, how we need to proceed in these systems. He also said, you know, the world's awash in technology. It's a question of what you can engineer to solve the problems that the Navy needs and what can be useful for the mission. And again, I don't want to seem like I'm uh, you know, contradicting the general, but the Navy's done the digital transformation already. Now we need to improve it. We did that in the, in the developing the Aegis system, in developing these systems at which we are using the major combatants. Now it's a question of how you apply AI to that to improve that. But I think the Navy is, has been the digital service because of the whole nature of the fact, you know, we operate ships, we're operating equipment, and we've worked on that. The other issue is um, it depends on how you, your view of AI depends on how you define it. And if we just define it as um, uh, systems that could replicate uh, human decision making, then in that case, you know, the Navy's already got AI. The close-in weapon system detects, tracks, 
uh, got a fire control solution, and if you had it, an auto shoots as if they're, they were a person. Normally, we don't operate it that. We uh, usually have an operator. But if you just define AI as some people have, and the original AI scientists did as replicating human decisions, we're already doing that. The question is the second definition, which is how you design systems that can predict future behavior based on the data that they receive. And our learning systems, not just uh, rules systems. And that, that's going to be the real challenge. Yeah, thank you. So I, I want to jump to, um, right, as a teacher of AI, one of the things that's most interesting to me in the classroom is how at the end of the semester, students say, I had no idea there was this much art in the science. I had no idea there was this much bias in the science. I had no idea there was so much uh, unseen trouble, right? When somebody puts science around numbers, the solution that comes out of the black box seems very trustworthy. And they say, I now trust AI less. I trust machine learning less. And I'm glad I'm an expert in it now so that I can deal with this. So my question is, is as more and more decisions are offloaded, to autonomous systems. And I want to open this up to whoever has the most eager answer to this. As we offload decisions to autonomous systems, how do we hold ourselves responsible for our values rather than just trusting the box? Yeah, Mike. Yeah, I think, I think there's, there's, there's two points there. One, one is, is like sort of the familiarity with AI and understanding it, bias, um, errors, et cetera. Think about human decision making. Is there bias? Are there errors? Is it latent? You know, I mean, so you have the same, so, so, so it's really important for students of this art to really understand all, all of the aspects of that. Um, you could argue that bias is the purpose of AI, right? Because you're biasing to understand a thesis like, wow, you know, there's a pattern here and it looks like a pattern I've seen before and so I think that we're over here. So, so you, your data will bias you to that answer and that's a good thing. But sometimes, if, if, you, if you give uh, machine learning algorithms the wrong data or you give it too much of one type of data, uh, famous example, uh, you know, a uh, AI algorithm fed pictures of trains to identify a train. And it did. That's a train, that's a train, that's a train, that's a train. Then they showed them a picture of a, of a, of a train track with no train on it. And, and it said, that's a train. Because every picture I've been told is a train has these little rails, right? And so like that kind of bias sneaks into these things. And this is really important for humans to understand that environment. That's really critical. So, so like understanding the technology is, is an absolutely imperative here. And, the, and implementing it, again, like the Navy's doing, in function by function so that you actually have the functional expertise and the technical expertise together to actually understand how to do this. The worst thing you can do is bring in just technical expertise and say, you know what, let's bring a data scientist in here and he'll, he'll lay this all out for us. No, you have to have the war fighting experts who understand the processes that have to be implemented and then bring the technologists into that space. So that, that's a really important point, the relationship between functional experts and technical experts. There's another really important point, and we, we haven't really uh, touched on it yet, but, but this human-machine teaming, right? So when we talk about autonomy, um, I, I, several people have used the, you know, well, we're displacing all these decisions, uh, you, you know, and, and letting machines make the decisions. Nonsense. Nonsense. What we're doing is building decision support tools that allow human commanders to understand their environment faster and better. That's all this is, right? And so, so when you start sort of anthropomorphizing, anthropomorphizing uh, uh, you know, the, the technology, then you're probably in a dangerous place, right? So, so I think we just have to take a really, uh, you know, a, a steady-eyed look at what is it that we're actually building? Where is the value of AI? And it's recognizing patterns in data. It's extending the human's ability to see into the data environment and be able to draw insights out of that. And then the humans will do what the humans will do with that. Human-machine teaming is a really important point. I and mean, we could talk all day about this. But this is, how do you actually define the relationship between the human, whether it's a decision maker or a warehouse clerk or whatever, um, uh, and the technology, right? And what that technology produces. So there is, you know, there, there's three pieces of that conversation, right? Like, okay, does the human know what to expect? Does the human know how to ask? 
Does the, does, does the human know what he wants or she wants? There's the machine. Can the machine actually respond to that, those requirements? And then there's the interface between the two. And this is a really, it's a, it's a huge conversation because it's ripe for error, it's ripe for bias, it's ripe for mistakes. And then, so we have the obligation to continue to ensure that when we talk about human machine teaming, we understand unintended consequences. We understand unintended responses. We understand execution of a function in a way that we didn't envision before, right? So, so like all of that, that's, that's science and art of decision making that has to be applied here. It's not enough to say, well, it's too hard, it's dangerous, I'm just gonna throw my hands up. We can't do that, right? We will, we will not compete effectively with the Chinese if we, if we do. I'd like to follow on. So this, and this is where I think, this is what makes AI unique, uh, for me anyway, uh, in comparison to other technologies. The role of the human. For me, it's a very human focused endeavor. Um, if you, as Mike said, if you lock a technologist, AI expert in a room alone and ask him to develop code, you failed, okay? Without that warfighter or user or a representative of that community that lives and breathes in that mission or function space, that is step one, an AI expert and the people that are gonna be using it. Um, it's so important. At the end, again, for me, the outcome is, is to, Augment human decision making. Augment manned operations with unmanned assets. And I wouldn't. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna contradict myself here in a second and say that um, I, I don't like the word offload decisions to autonomous systems. Um, there are some. I'll give you an example in a sec. But for me, the decision chiefly will always be made by the human. In most cases, there are some small cases where it doesn't make sense for matters of time or volume. But by and large, the AI is there to augment and provide a human decision maker a range of options and recommendations so he can make a better, he or she can make a better decision. Um, if, now here's the other piece. If you are an unmanned underwater vehicle and you've been given a mission and you encounter a sea mount or a rock or an obstacle, um, I am perfectly happy delegating the decision of whether to go left, right, or around safely uh, around that object to the platform. That's the, that just shows you when we talk about offloading or delegating decisions, there's, there's a sliding scale, right? We have to be cognizant of. That's, that's got to appear, appear in your calculus. That's where the perspective of a human being helped or the customer, the warfighter, sailor, marine, is important in the design of the code and the capability. Um, can, can I pile on something there, yeah, Brett? Just, just yeah, because right. it, it's not just a good idea. It is the Department of Defense's policy that appropriate levels of human judgment will be applied in every case when you're contemplating uh, the application of force, right? That's, that is the department's policy. So like, we don't have an option to put out an unethical, unobserved, untrained, and uh, 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 artificial intelligence algorithm or any other algorithm, right? We, we have constrained ourselves to that human judgment oversight. Nobody else in the world has done that. Thank you. Um, and so I, I wanna make sure we can get to questions. So I hate okay. to do it, but can you keep it? Real, real yeah, quick. Thank you. Um, it, the question is where in the loop should humans be? And, the, and the, that's a hard question because somebody, some people think it's going to be at the decision making Point, but let me give you a, a quick example. Nothing to do with AI. Naval mining, you know, old captor mine in the uh, Cold War. Uh, it calculates, counts the number of ships, detect what type of ships, fires off the uh, fires off the mine. Now, where was humans in the loop? They were in the loop because they decided where to put that system. That's where the decision is made. So the question is, looking at that, is where in the loop? Because a lot of people perceive, you know, it's not going to, you know, you need a human in the loop midstream of this. But we've already, in the past, created weapons that the humans aren't in the loop midstream. Uh, it, so again, that's one of the questions in handling ethics. Where in the loop does the human have to be? 
And that's, that's a tough question in a wartime scenario. Thank you very much. Okay, so now it's time for questions. So we can take virtual questions for those of you who are watching from somewhere else. We can take in-person questions if you don't mind coming up to the microphones. Uh, so we have some virtual ones to hear here to get us started. Um, so a lot of you have, or several of you, have used the term digital transformation. What do you mean by digital transformation, and how does AI fit into it? I'll start. Um, so for me, I'll, I'll go back to you know the four horsemen. Um, speed. And I'm repeating myself on purpose here. I think speed, velocity is one of the dominant factors. I think it's one of the ways that AI will change the nature of warfare, not the essential nature, but its conduct. Um, so how do we strike the right velocity? Uh, for me, I look at folks who are doing digital well. Who are the, the, who, who are the benchmark as I look out there? Who does it well? That has some, some aspects that we can relate to in the Navy. Um, for me, um, I like Formula One. Um, it's a very digital enterprise. They move ones and zeros in real time. Um, like the Navy, every time they put a car on the track, lives are at stake and at risk. So they have to take their job very seriously. They can manufacture parts in minutes. They can manufacture a car in a, a day or two because they're digital. Um, what does that mean? That means data. The, the data is good, it's accessible, it's of the right quality, sufficient quality for the task. Uh, they have compute where it needs to be. Their cars are censored up to the hilt. And in every race, there's, there's information flowing all the time, if you ever watch, to screens where the, the teams are watching the cars. And then competency, the people, the drivers, right? Um, for us, um, for AI in the Navy, data is the fuel, the compute is the engine, and the drivers are sailors and Marines. Without those three things, you're not digital. You're not going to operate or act like it. Um, I like the F1 example. Well, I'm a new found fan of F Formula One. I, I just like watching it, but it, it's a great it's a great um, it's a great analogy. Um, I have a um, this is the Navy AI patch. At the bottom, there's some Latin pressure velocius means four C faster. That's our motto. It's our mantra. It should be. That's why it's the Navy AI motto. And um, I think another good one, a very famous naval officer, um, I have no wish to be connected with a ship that does not sail fast, for I intend to go in harm's way. And that, should, that could easily be another ma mantra for Navy AI. So. Thank you. I love a prop. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> <Thank Yeah. you. laughs> Happy to advertise. Yeah. Yeah, Mike, you've, you've used well, this sure. as well. So, so here's my prop. So like when I drove here today, um, I got at navigation that told me the best route to go. Uh, it told me that there was traffic ahead. It told me where, the, where I could get coffee on the way. It told me what time I was going to arrive. Um, all as a result of digital transformation, right? The data is being collected the data is being made available, and now a host of users with applications across the entire spectrum can make use of that data environment in, 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 you know, in a civilian capacity, in a, you know, you know, as we live our lives, you know, we use it every day. That competitive advantage that we gain by using that in a military environment is what we seek and what we should seek. That is, like, how can we observe, orient, decide, act quicker, right? How about this? If you have the ability, because you're managing your sensors and those sensors are digitized and they're flowing that data back to you or someplace where you can operate on it, and so that to a degree you're always observing, right? Because you have that live data environment. What's actually happening around me? Not just red, but blue as well, right? So you're observing all the time. 
You're orienting all the time because you've identified patterns in threat activity. You know what? Every time that fleet does that exercise, they always lead to the left, right? You know, or whatever. You know, they always lead. They put a, three destroyers out front. Like, like that, that's a pattern, right? So now you're observing that activity. You're oriented on, there's a context to that activity. Now you can decide, um, what does that do for your OODA loop? It's kind of like, it's just duh loop, right? 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 So, because you're, you're always observing, you're always oriented, you can decide and act really quickly. That's how you win, right? It's generating tempo and, and operating with precision as a result of that. OODA is one example, everything else that we do today on our artifacts um, is, is, the same, is the same principle. Yeah, thank you. KJ Delamere, uh, OpNav N722, and, and my night job teaching strategy for the Naval War College. Um, during the Cold War, we tended to look at the Russians as being 27 feet tall and overestimated what a MiG-25 or a Hind could do until we got our hands on one of them. We see a lot of very pessimistic uh, assessments of how far ahead China is. Are we making China in the AI world 27 feet tall like we did with the Russians in the Cold War? Sam, that sounds like a place for you to start. <laughs> um, there's a difference between how their systems operate and what their ambitions are. Chinese are not today seven feet tall. However, their ambition is to be. So if we're looking at the future and looking at future capabilities, that's the sort of thing that, that we, we need to keep in mind. Again, when you look at investment, and you can tell future capabilities based on investment, uh, you know, which, who has the, the uh, investment, you know, who has the incentive to invest a great deal in the system? Well, again, if you're using it for social control as well as military applications, you have a great in incentive to investment. I, they have a, a wonderful, uh, uh, incentive for CEOs of their uh, technology companies to work very close with the military because uh, a number, and they've, they've used this, there's a number of reasons you could have a uh, corruption investigation of practically anything. And uh, if that happens and the, the trials are actually kept in secret, the penalty is death. So for a CEO of a company, of a technological company, it's really the incentive there to work with the government and produce a military applications is really there. So may not be 10 feet tall today, but we're looking, we need to look at investment for the future. That's yeah, thank you. Yeah. Our clock is ticking, so let's view it like a, a lightning round here, please. Uh, just to pile on, because I think, I think this idea of organization versus innovation is really important, right? The Chinese have the ability, through civil-military fusion, as, as Dr. Tangridi just described, they, they practice every day. Health status, neighborhood status, uh, party status. I mean, all of this is measured. Everybody's seen the video, right, of uh, you know, the man walking across the street and being identified across six different parameters. You know, and, and so, like, holy cow, that's impressive. Now, the question is, can they actually turn that machine? There's nobody better at surveilling their people than the Chinese government, right? Nobody. So, can, but can they effectively turn that capability into a warfighting capability? And this is where the, the, the balance of innovation comes in, right? So how do we balance organization and can we innovate that to, you know, can they innovate and then can we innovate faster? Can we innovate enough and organize ourselves enough so that we actually have the enterprise that can fight effectively against an opponent that is largely organized, not innovative. Thank you. All right, so we have time for one more question if we're quick, sir. Jim Ramondo from the uh, Navy's Digital Transformation Office. <laughs> Interestingly, I've been flying wing Good for with you. Brett on a little bit of this, but General, to your, to your point of organization, I'm wondering if you could talk just a little bit about the CDAO and the, the genesis of that and how that might help with, with this across the department and the implications for the Navy and Marine Corps specifically. And, you know, we're independent uh, usually and kind of give the Heisman to those joint things in the past. Yeah. So just one of your thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great observation. Um, 
you know, the only thing that unifies the services is opposition to OSD, right? So, so, so um, however, here's, here's the thought process, right? So we had organizations focused on particular technologies, the Jake, for example, focused on AI. I think the, the, the insight was, hey, you know what? We have to deal with this larger digital transformation. AI doesn't work unless you have a data environment unless you have a platform environment, unless you have processes that you can digitize. So, so I think the thought process behind the CDAO is let's get all of that into one place where we can actually manage it like cohesively uh, at the top. That still leaves us though, uh, so if you have a highly organized OSD or, uh, 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 agenda, still leaves you with our core culture of separate services, largely following uh, building domain-specific hardware through a hardware process in an environment where software now becomes the, 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 the primary capability driver and software evolves continuously, right? So how do you take a tribal segmented hardware environment and operate it as an integrated software environment? This is our core challenge. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, first, I would like to extend our thanks from the Naval Institute to Dr. Taylor, Dr. Tangretti, Mr. Brett Vaughn, and Lieutenant General Mike Grone for a superb discussion. I'll be honest, going in as a uh, liberal arts guy, economics major, I wasn't so sure about this AI thing <laughs> for an hour and 10 minutes. You guys have made it fly by. And uh, it's very clear that we need to do more in this area and, uh, and that the amount of emphasis on the man in the loop the woman in the loop, and the skepticism of both the people and the machines with respect to this has really come through loud and clear. It's a tremendous point. So I'd like to thank our panelists and our moderator, and let's give them all a big hand. <laughs> I want to mention that uh, afterwards, uh, one of our panelists, Dr. Sam Tangretti, is also a Naval Institute Press author and he'll be available to sign his book, AI at War, and uh, outside for people who are interested, and we thank you, Sam. And uh, for today, as a gift to our panelists, I'd like to do this Naval Institute Press book as a gift, War Transformed, The Future of the 21st Century Great Power Competition and Conflict by Mick Ryan, one of our more popular books. So I'm gonna give each one this book, and let's give each one one more hand. Thank you very much.